Right, we'll just make sure our phones are off, folks, eh? I think we'll just get the show on the road and welcome to the Devolution for the Powers Committee, the 17th meeting. Um, agenda item one this morning is a stage two of the Scottish Elections Reductions of Voting Age Bill. I welcome members to the meeting. Uh, the first item of business, as I say, is that the bill at stage two, and I also welcome the Minister for Parliamentary Business, Joe Fitzpatrick, and his officials to the meeting. The officials are Colin Brown, who is the Senior Principal Legal Officer, Helen Clifford, who is the Bill Team Leader, Willie Ferry, who is the Parliamentary Council, and we have Gillian Cross, who is the Elections Policy Advisor. Now, um, we're undertaking a slightly different process as far as the conveners are concerned this morning. My script for amendments at stage two is on the iPad. It's a pilot scheme um, to make sure that digital parliament comes into reality. It's either a pilot scheme or a guinea pig. I'm not sure which winner I am. But, so if, if things don't go quite to, to script, I shall turn to the paper copy. With that being said, um, can we just get underway? Um, and as far as the section one concerns, there are no amendments. So the question is that section one be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We now come to the group Young Persons Information, Protection of Information and Exemptions. I call Amendment 1 in the name of John Swinney, grouped with Amendments 5 to 13. The Minister for Parliamentary Business to move Amendment 1 and speak to all <coughs> amendments in the group. Convener, um, good morning. And, um, so the amendments in this group arise from the ongoing discussions that we've had with stakeholders. As the committee is aware, the government has worked closely with electoral administrators, the Electoral Commission and others to ensure the provisions of the bill are workable and the amendments in this group are technical amendments aimed at improving the bill's provisions on protection of information relating to those aged under 16. Um, amendments 1 and 8 address an issue raised in evidence given by the Scottish Assessors Association and the Information Commissioner's Office, the pre that is the pre-printing of voter information on the annual household inquiry form. Pre-printing of information on the canvas form is standard practice and has been shown to improve registration rates. Amendment 8 therefore makes it clear that one of the very limited ways in which a young person's information can be used is on the pre-populated canvas form. However, this will um, be subject to the restrictions set out in Amendment 1. Amendment 1 provides that where an electoral registration officer is pre-populating a canvas form and the details of, any <clears throat> of anyone believed to be living at a particular household, the date of birth of anyone under the age of 16 must not be included. The, this responds to concerns raised by both the Information Commissioner's Office and the Scottish Assessors Association about pre-population and strengths, strengthens the protection on young voters' information. Amendments 5, 7, 9 and 10 all relate to absent voter records and lists kept by electoral registration officers in relation to local government elections. Those are the postal voters list, the list of proxies and the proxy voter lists. Under normal procedures, EROs periodically circulated those lists to various persons, usually ahead of an election. These amendments put beyond doubt um, that the information contained in those lists is included within the definition of young persons' information set out in Section 12 of the Bill, so that the information on the records and lists will be subject to the stringent protections set out in Sections 12 and 13 of the Bill. These amendments have been developed following detailed discussions with electoral registration officers. Amendments 6 and 11 are drafting amendments to provide consistency in the reference to young persons in Section 13. Amendment 12 addresses an issue raised by the Electoral um, Commission during Stage 1 around uh, checking the permissibility of donations or loans. Political parties and candidates are required to check that donations over a certain value come from a permissible donor, <coughs> as defined in Section 54 of the Political Parties Elections and Referendum Act 2000. Similarly, that Act provides that any loans made to political parties must be by an authorised participant, which is defined as being a permissible donor within the meaning of Section 54. So this section provides that, among other things, in order to be a permissible donor, the individual must be on an electoral register in the UK, which includes being on a register as an attainer. Because the Bill controls <clears throat> on the availability of information of those aged under 16, the Electoral Commission commented that a mechanism would need to be put in place to allow their permissibility as donors or lenders to be checked. 
a point subsequently picked up by this committee at stage, in your Stage 1 report. Section 13.5 of the Bill already provides that the EROs is, are permitted to disclose a young person's information to the young person themselves. This amendment will require the registration officer to do so if the individual requests it for the purpose of verifying that they are a permissible donor under the terms of Section 54.2a of the Political Parties, Elections and Referendums Act 2000. As a result of this bill, 16 and 17 year olds will be able to appoint and act as proxy voters. As part of the normal electoral practice, electoral registration officers need to be able to write to anyone appointed as a proxy to confirm their appointment. The proxy will also need to be supplied with the elector's name, address and electoral number as part of the proxy poll card. Amendment 13 therefore adds a new section into section 13 of the bill to create further exemption to the general prohibition of disclosing a young person's information by allowing that information to be disclosed to a person appointed by them to vote as their proxy. Convener, these amendments are the result of a continued constructive engagement with stakeholders. They are aimed at ensuring the package of measures contained within the Bill strike an appropriate balance between the protection of sensitive information on young voters and the need for transparency, integrity and efficacy of the registration system. I believe that these amendments, um, with these amendments the Bill achieves that balance as far as possible and I recommend them to the Committee. I therefore move Amendment 1. Good. Any Committee members got any comments? Alex Johnson. Thank you very much. I, I think you've in fact answered the question uh, uh, that I had. It relates to uh, Amendment 13. And on first reading, I uh, found myself thinking, why would that be necessary? But are you suggesting that this is so that it is possible to put that information in the paperwork that would be issued to the proxy? Yeah, thank you very much. By the Minister for Planning. Lewis. Likewise, on Amendment 13, for clarity, I was. Uh, keen to understand uh, how, how narrow or wide the range of circumstances are where a person whose details are protected here because they're under 16 is in a position to appoint a proxy to vote for them at an election. Is this simply in relation to um, a person who attains the age of 16 um, within a number of weeks of the, of, of the election date? And secondly, in relation to uh, Amendment 12, uh, that inserts a new clause uh, and, uh, in relation to uh, the supply of a young person's information and uh, it's in terms of that the uh, registration officer must supply this information. Uh, the previous uh, uh, point, the previous clause in, in the same section, a young person's information, information may be disclosed to the person to whom it relates, doesn't have the same uh, mandatory force clearly as must. Uh, at request, and I, I wonder if there's an explanation or if we should read any significance into the difference between may and must in those two parts. Um, the, the, the difference in may and must is, is actually very important because previously um, it could be produced and now it must be produced at the request of the young person. So this is about enabling young people to participate in the, 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 the election electoral process fully while still ensuring that their, their details are entirely protected. Um, obviously, in, in terms of Amendment 13, the, this, is, this is very specific circumstances and at the request of the young person. Well, that answers your point. If I may come back, yeah, sure. I, I was, I was, my, my, my point in 13 was more how, 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 what the application of this is likely to be, given that a, a young person, at the point their details are protected, they're under the age of 16, they're clearly not in a position to vote at an election at that point, and therefore the appointment of a proxy. Is this in relation to yeah, people right. attaining just prior to the election? Yeah, sorry, so I understand your question now. So it's only when they would be able to vote in the election coming up, so in the, the, the few weeks beforehand when the, the, that fuller register yeah. is produced. Understood. Thank you very okay. much. Any other comments? <coughs> okay, Minister, would you want to indicate if you want to press or withdraw? Uh, moved. You, you're pressing. Okay, thank you. Uh, the question is that Amendment 1 be agreed to, are we all agreed? Yes. Amendment 1 is agreed to. The question is that section 2 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that sections 3 and 4 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. All agreed. We now come to the group applications for registration statement where date of birth not required and use of online service by under 16s. I call amendment 2 in the name of John Swinney, group with amendment 3, Minister for Parliamentary Business, to move amendment 2 and speak to both amendments in the group. 
Thank you, Convener. Amendments 2 and 3 relate to individual applications for registration. Amendment 2 concerns the current requirement for an, application to select, an applicant to select um, the age group that applies to them if they do not know their date of birth. Under current rules, an individual in such circumstances would be asked to tick a box on their application form saying whether they are over 18 or under 18 in order to determine their eligibility to vote. Because the bill requires application, applications from under 16s are handled in a different way from those aged 16 and 17, the Electoral Commission and Electoral Registration Officers have requested that a third age category be added to the application form. This amendment therefore provides that when where a person cannot provide their date of birth, they should be asked whether they are under 16, 16 or 17, or 18 and over. Um, this 18 or over. This will allow an electoral registration officer to determine how to progress an application form uh, from a person if they are unable to supply their date of birth. Amendment 3 is a minor amendment which removes the current disapplication of Registration 269 of the Representation of the People of Scotland Regulation 2001 at Section 5.2b of the Bill. This relates to applications to register submitted by those aged under 16. That regulation was initially disapplied in the Bill because <clears throat> it was unclear, as to what, uh, uh, unclear at that point the extent to which those aged under 16 would be able to use the individual electoral registration digital service to submit an application for registration. The digital service has been developed by Cabinet Office to receive and verify applications for registration, in particular by allowing checks of names, dates and dates of birth and national insurance numbers against government databases. As most of those aged under 16 will not have a national insurance number, their details cannot be verified through the digital service. The bill as introduced therefore prevented them using its online application system. The Scottish Government has, however, since agreed with the Cabinet Office that 14 and 15-year-olds will be able to enter their details online through the digital service. The details will then be passed to the Electoral Registration Officer for verification and be treated as an application for registration. So the digital service will therefore act as a conduit for young voters' details, giving young voters access to the same online application system as older voters. Amendment 3 is required to ensure that what is provided by 14 and 15 year olds online can be treated as an application to register. So the Scottish Government officials have been in regular contact with the Cabinet Office to ensure that the questions that those under 16 are asked when using the online system and the information they are given properly explains <coughs> the general arrangements for the provisions and use of that information. Convener, these amendments are aimed at streamlining the registration process and ensuring that the application forms and online systems work well for the voter and the electoral administrators. I therefore move amendments amendment two and three. Thank you, Minister. Any comments from committee members? Okay, no comments. I'm assuming, um, Minister, you want to press? press. Thank you. The question is that amendment two be agreed to or all agreed? Yes. Amendment two is agreed to. I call Amendment 3 in the name of John Swinney. I already debated with Amendment 2, Minister for Parliamentary Business, to move formally. Formally moved. The question is, Amendment 3 be agreed to or well agreed? Yes. Amendment 3 is agreed to. The question is, uh, Section 5 be agreed to or well agreed? Yes. The question is, that Section 6 and 11 agreed to or well agreed? 6 to 11. Sorry, 6 to 11. Uh, we come to the group Indication and Combined Registers of Attain of age of 18. I call Amendment 4 in the name of John Swinney and a group on its own, Minister for Parliamentary Business, to move and speak to Amendment 4. Convener, Amendment 4 responds to an issue raised during Stage 1 evidence by the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Services. Um, as the Committee is aware, existing legislation provides for an annual publication of electoral registers on or after the 1st of December each year. That legislation further provides that, so far as possible, the Westminster Register and the Local Government Register should be combined. Those combined registers are used by a range of groups and individuals, including political parties, the Electoral Commission and the Scottish Courts and Tribunals Service. 16- and 17-year-old attainers are currently included on the published register, which show their date of attainment of age 18. Under, under the proposals of this bill, 
As all 16 and 17 year olds will be entitled to vote at Scottish Parliament and local government elections, the local government register and the combined register will contain details of all 16 and 17 year olds, i.e. not just those who will turn 18 during the life of the register. That would mean that there will be a group of 16 year olds appearing on the combined register who are not old enough to be Westminster attainers, but will of course be eligible to be local government or Scottish Parliament electors. Without this amendment, they would appear on the combined register without a date of attainment and would therefore appear to be over 18. That could have implications for those who use the register, but who need to know whether or not the individual has attained the age of 18. For example, the Scottish Courts and Tribunals um, Service, um, who need that information to establish eligibility for jury service. We have therefore agreed with the electoral registration officers that the most practical way forward is to for the combined register to include the dates of attainment of, of age 18 for all 16 and 17 year olds. Um, Amendment 4 achieves that. The Deputy First Minister indicated this planned approach during the stage 1 debate and I believe it is a sensible solution to a potential area of confusion. I think it is it's probably important to reiterate here that no details of anyone under the age of 16 will be included on these um, published combined registers and I therefore I move Amendment 4. <coughs> any committee members wish to make any comments? No comments wishing to be made. Members do you want to press? Yes. Good. The question is that Amendment 4 be agreed to or well agreed? Yes. Amendment 4 is agreed to. I call Amendments 5, 6 and 7, all in the name of John Swinney and all previously debated. I invite the Minister for Parliamentary Business to move Amendments 5 to 7 en bloc. Uh, but first of all, does any member object to a single question being put in Amendments 5 to 7? No objection. Um, the question is then amendments five. Minister, to Sorry, moved, Minister, to moved on yep, block. Yep, on block. The, the question is that amendments five to six be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Five to seven. Five to seven be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Amendments five to seven are agreed to. The question is that section twelve be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call amendments eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, and thirteen. All in the name of John Swinney and all previously debated. I invite the Minister for Parliamentary Business to move Amendments 8 to 13 on block. Um, does any member object to a single question being put on Amendments 8 to 13? No objection. Moved on Minister, block. will you move? Thank moved you. on block. Moved on block. The question is that Amendments 8 to 13 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah. Amendments 8 to 13 are agreed to. The question is that section 13 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The question is that section 14 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We now come to the group voting age for proxies at local government elections. I call Amendment 14 in the name of John Swinney and a group of its own Minister for Parliamentary Business to move and to speak to Amendment 14. Convener, under these proposals, the normal rules with regard to absent voting will apply to 16 and 17 year olds as they apply to those aged 18 or over. As the Deputy First Minister has previously made clear, most of the age related arrangements in relation to normal electoral procedures, including absent voting, um, change automatically as a, as a result of the lowering of the voting age in the Bill. Um, a few will be dealt with in the upcoming Scottish Parliament election order or the local government election order. However, in <clears throat> reviewing the bill ahead of stage two, a reference in primary legislation to the local government proxy age being 18 was identified. Amendment 4 therefore makes an adjustment to that legislation to ensure that a person can vote as a proxy at local government elections in Scotland from the age of 16. The equivalent adjustment for Scottish Parliament elections will be made in the Scottish Parliament elections order. Thank you, Minister. Any and therefore wish? move. Amendment 14. Okay. Any members wish to make any comments? Okay. Minister, you wish to press or withdraw? Press. Press, thank you. The question is that Amendment 14 be agreed to or well agreed? Yes. Amendment 14 is agreed to. The question is that Amendment that Section 15 be agreed to or well agreed? We now to come to the group alterations in the register, persons aged prior to 1st December. 2015, I call Amendment 15 in the name of John Swinney in a group of its own, 
Minister for Parliamentary Business to move and to speak to Amendment 15. Thank you, Convener. Today's final amendment is again the result of discussions with electoral administrators. Section 13 of the Representation of the People's Act in 1983 requires publication of a revised version of electoral registers on the 1st of December each year, as, <clears throat> or such later date as is prescribed. EROs are also required to publish notice of alterations and additions to that register on the first day of every month, although not in the two months preceding the publication of the register, i.e. they don't need to publish in October and November 2015 this year. EROs raised concerns with the Scottish Government that there was a potential for confusion about entitlement to vote arising if a young person, if a young voter was included on the list of alterations to the register in the period between the bill coming into force and the publication of the new register on the 1st of December 2015. Although 16 and 17 year olds will appear on the local government register as persons entitled to vote, they are not actually able to do so until the 5th of May 2016. Amendment 15 therefore inserts a new section into the bill providing that new young voters should appear in the register for the first time when the new annual register is published on the 1st of December. That will allow registration officers to set out clear boundaries between the monthly alterations to the previous year's register and the new register published on the 1st of December, which will mark the start of the new register year during which 16 and 17 year olds will become eligible to vote. Um, I therefore recommend the committee supports the amendment and move amendment 15. Thank you, Minister. Any members wish to make any comments? Lewis. Simply a query to understand whether this means that the names of uh, 16 and 17 year olds will appear ordinarily in the register as of the bill coming into force or only as of the 1st of December? Only as of the 1st of December. Thank you very much. No other questions? The Minister, do you wish to press withdraw? Press. The question is that Amendment 15 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Amendment 15 is agreed to. The question is that Sections 16 and 19 be agreed to. 16 to 19 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The question is that the long title be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Okay. Thank you, colleagues, and thank you, Minister. That completes consideration of the Bill. An amended version of the Bill will be available tomorrow morning. Stage 3 amendments should be lodged by 4.30 p.m. on Monday with the legislation team. I thank the, the Minister for Parliamentary Business and his officials for their attendance. Thank you. And we'll just have a two-minute break until such time as we allow them to leave. Everyone's still here, so let's begin. Okay. Okay, committee, we now come to agenda item two. Agenda item two is the BBC Memorandum of Understanding, UK Government's proposals. I just want a short background explanation to where we're at on this particular item. item agenda item two involves consideration of a draft Memorandum of Understanding, MOU, setting out a procedure for scrutiny arrangements in relation to the BBC in order that the Scottish Parliament can be consulted during the process of the BBC Charter Review, which is due to commence shortly. The MOU arises out of the recommendation of the Smith Commission that the Scottish Parliament should be consulted on matters pertaining to the BBC that impact on Scotland, notably the BBC Charter Review in the short term and also with regard to the BBC annual reports and accounts in the future. It is intended that the signatories to the MOU will be the Scottish Parliament, the Scottish Government, Department of Culture, Media and Sport and the BBC. I would like to emphasise that the draft MOU deals solely with the process of how the BBC engages and consults with the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government in future. The MOU does not deal with in any respect the subject matter of any 
of the BBC program, programming or activities, or the question of whether broadcasting should be part of any proposal for the further devolution of powers. This is not the focus of the discussion today. I ask you to note that on the 8th of June, the Cabinet Secretary for Culture, Europe and External Affairs wrote to us setting out the Scottish Government's views on the draft MOU and suggesting a number of amendments to the MOU. I think that actually, St Stephen, that there's a slight anomaly, if I got that correct, in the letter sent to us um, by the Cabinet Secretary. Do you think you could just explain that while, while we're at this? Uh, yes, happy to do that, Convener. Uh, if members have the letter from the Cabinet Secretary for Culture, Europe and External Affairs in front of them and compare the, the track changes that the Scottish Government Minister is suggesting, you'll note um, it's slightly different in terms of how it's been marked up. Um, under Commitments, Paragraph 1, Charter Review, it's actually the third bullet point there, the one that reads... The Department will consult the Scottish Government on the draft charter through the process of charter drafting. That is the significant change. It's not the one indicated above. So the, the new bullet point that the Scottish Government suggests uh, to be inserted into the, the draft MOU is the one that reads, the Department will consult the Scottish Government on the draft charter through the process of charter drafting. And also under paragraph four, next charter, there's some uh, suggested changes there from the, from the Scottish Government. Okay, is everyone clear? Okay. Um, I think we should also note that the responses have also been received from Education and Culture Committee and the Public Audit Committee on the draft MOU, and these responses were already emailed to us. Um, now, I, I just wonder at this stage, Stuart, do you want to make any comments? Or do... well, yeah, we, we were also written to by the uh, Cabinet Secretary, um, basically the same letter as has been written to uh, this committee. Um, we examined the draft memoran memorandum of understanding on Tuesday of this week uh, and the letter from the government, and we took the view, uh, uh, as outlined in the letter, to the committee, yourself, convener, that effectively our primary aim uh, in this um, was to ensure that, the, as this committee said themselves, that the spirit and the substance of Smith should be our underlying principle. Um, and whatever is agreed between the two governments with regard to the Memorandum of Understanding. And it was the view of the Education and Culture Committee that that should be what is achieved by the Memorandum of Understanding. We took no view on whether the original draft or the amendments achieved that, but we just take note of the government's view that uh, they felt it did not. Um, and our view was that whatever is agreed must meet the Smith Commission uh, guarantees. We also had a response from the Public Audit Committee. Stephen and then I'll ask Tavish or, or Stuart McMillan whether they want to say anything. Just... Yeah, just to give the committee a flavour of the, uh, the second committee that looked at the MOU, that being the Public Audit Committee that looked at, that, uh, at the MOU on Wednesday of this week. Um, Mr Scott and Mr Macmillan, obviously members of that committee, may additionally wish to comment, but the two points that uh, I refer members to of substance in the Public Audit Committee's uh, letter to you are first... The Public Audit Committee is suggesting that um, if and when the Secretary of State or the Foreign Secretary, who has the power to give directions uh, to the BBC on um, annual reports and issues of finance, administration and work of the BBC, if and when they, they chose to exercise those directions, the Public Audit Committee is suggesting that consultation with the Scottish Parliament take place before any such directions are made. The second substantive point from the Public Audit Committee refers to the laying of annual reports and the question of what days those take place. The current draft of the MOU says next available sitting day. Now, usually annual reports from the BBC are produced in the month of July. That means that the Scottish Parliament would be likely to be in recess. The next available sitting day would therefore be uh, much later in the year, in September. And therefore, there would be a difference between when the annual report is uh, laid here and in Westminster. So the Public Audit Committee is suggesting that uh, we change that wording. We propose to DCMS, excuse me, to change that wording to uh, the next day on which the office of the clerk is open, the office of the clerk being open through the... The, the summer recess. So we would therefore uh, be laying annual reports at the same time as Westminster to here. Those are the two suggested changes from Public Audit Committee. On both of those and on DCMS, um, uh, sorry, on both of those and on 
uh, Ms Hislop's suggestions, we've not had any commentary back from uh, UK Department of Culture, Media and Sport as to whether or not they're happy with those amendments yet. Tell me, do you want to say any more? Or are you happy with that? I think Mr. Uh, Stephen's given a very fair um, uh, illustration. I mean, you, uh, I suppose colleagues would understand that from an audit committee perspective, our interest was in the data and uh, uh, well, in the data that uh, should be Scottish specific, which would help Parliament do a, a more effective job in assessing the performance of the BBC, and that was our main point. But Stephen's made a couple of, uh, I think we made a couple of technical suggestions about how to improve that, which he's just outlined. Stuart. Okay. Um, we're in a situation now then where we have obviously the public audit committee's um, proposals put forward um, which have not been considered either by DCMS yet or the Scottish Government because of the time scale involved, it's obvious. Um, the suggestions made by the Scottish Government through the Cabinet Secretary, DCMS, again, is, is pretty obvious as Stephen has said, have not had yet the opportunity to consider. Um, the, that response. So I think we're not quite at a situation yet where I think we can move to agreement on the MOU because they're still to pull in information from other sources. So can I suggest that we, um, we're, we that we, at this stage we should delay consider, consideration of the MOU until we do obtain comments from both DCMS and the Scottish Government? Well, I think we need to, the clerks will need to go away and try and find out that. There may be discussions ongoing between the DCMS and the Scottish Government about these issues just mm -hmm. now, because obviously the Scottish Government have put forward their view on where the MOU needs to be adjusted. So that, I, I hope we can do that in the next couple of weeks um, before we get to recess, but it's really up to the discussions that take place between these other parties um, to come to a conclusion first. That being said, and, and thank you for that, um, um, the, the, thank you members for attendance at today's meeting. The next meeting we will be on the 18th of June when the committee will be considering its work programme in relation to the Scotland Bill and the committee subsequent meeting on the 25th of June. The committee expects to hear from both the Deputy First Minister and the Secretary of State for Scotland on the Scotland Bill. And I know so, so the 18th is just a work programme discussion. Rather just a work programme. Not David Mundell. No, not no. David Mundell. Okay. And they're both coming now on the 25th. 24th. Thank you. Okay. I now close this meeting. Thank you very much.